So just a clarification, I'm neither a scientist nor an academician. I am here to represent a viewpoint that Dietram described this morning in his opening remarks as unfortunate. <laughs> and that perspective is a marketing perspective. I work for a market services company that gets paid about three, uh, north of $3 billion a year to help companies try to understand what motivates consumers to buy. We do a tremendous amount of work to help inform those questions around what to buy, where to buy it, what motivating messages will get people to consider and buy, and inform strategy on that basis. So that's the perspective that I'm hoping to share. And when thinking about this discussion, as this title would suggest, and as Dietram also mentioned, and we've heard from Dominique and others, from my perspective, the debate has already been framed for consumers in the United States, and that it has been framed negatively. And perhaps on the basis of what we've also talked about today, sort of a bumper sticker opinion. Whenever you can communicate something very concisely, as this image does, to somebody who may not understand what a GMO is, your first impression in terms of the awareness building phase is a negative one. And this image is a marketer's dream. You can quickly, concisely get your message out in a way that all of a sudden orients somebody in a particular way. The two things that I'm going to argue for today is that I do believe consumers have generally, negative have, generally have a negative opinion about GMOs, although they're not well informed about them. For me, the debate is then more about living with trade-offs and finding acceptable benefits, as we just heard from Dominique. And you can think about, say, the carbon fuel debate. You can survey consumers and say, yes, we agree carbon fuel has a net negative impact to the, to the world. But there's so many benefits that come along with it that it's acceptable in that kind of terminology. And then finally, activists and interest groups uh, have framed the debate already. And they could move consumer behavior through either a regulatory path or a corporate concern path. And we've talked a little bit about that as well. And the point that I'm going to try to make here is, left unabated, these activist groups will continue in their agenda in a way that will ultimately influence the influencers that could change a market dynamic from a consumer perspective. So I want you all to think of somebody who you have in your life who's a non-scientist. Could be a family member, could be a friend. Just mentally picture who that person is. Now imagine you are speaking with that person. You're saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to Washington, DC, and I'm going to talk about GMOs. And that person may have an understanding of what that is or may not. So that person says, gosh, my friend is going to go talk about GMOs. I want, to, I want to know what she's talking about. What is this subject? And you go to Google, and you do a search on GMO. Or you go to Netflix, the most popular online video subscription service that exists, and you do a search on GMO. Or you go to Amazon, which is the world's leading bookstore, and you do a search on GMO. And what can you guess is going to come, come up? The average person who has the time and attention to think about GMOs will be inundated with negative associations of GMOs through all of these devices. And it, in ways that I consider to be, from a communications perspective, quite thoughtful and quite uh, effective. If you go to a typical GMO website on a, doing a Google search, you'll encounter something like this. It'll be a multimodal we uh, communications website, meaning you can go long form narrative, short form narrative, video. You can have click advocacy by just saying, I support this, and I can actually give money to it. There's a host of different communications uh, components to a level of sophistication that, in and of itself, suggests leg legitimacy, let alone appealing to various learning styles from a communications perspective. If you were to target it, go even further, and you go to Netflix, boy, you get a great film, GMOMG. It's a foreign award-winning film at that. And if you look at the sophistication of how this has evolved from the no GMO side, just the, the GMOOMG suggests a level of segment-specific targeting. This is a millennial medium, digital. OMG is a text message uh, vernacular, which is intuitively relevant to a younger demographic, 18 to 30, and even younger. 
Right? So all of a sudden, the level of sophistication and, and, and communication that is occurring from the messenger is really understanding the message E. Or you can continue your click activism by targeting specific companies that have been highlighted by these intermediaries in order to register your vote against, whether it be Sabra or Starbucks or Cheerios or Dean Foods. All you have to do is one click of the button to say, hey, I want you, company X, to understand that what you're doing here is something that I oppose as a consumer of your product. Now, some of us might say, well, that's interesting, or so what, or it hasn't been forceful enough to date to make a material difference relative to the GMO application in our food products from a consumer perspective. And there's an argument that that's correct. I would say that it won't take much to change that. And this is the second component of my conversation. And that is whether it be leading indicators like Chipotle, which becomes the first restaurant to label GMOs and aims to go non-GMO. Now, Chipotle is the most successful quick service restaurant initial public offering that has happened in the last 20 years. It is widely regarded in the food and beverage industry as being exactly on trend in terms of popular interests. Right? And food integrity is their brand positioning. So when somebody who is commercially successful and who has this kind of uh, value proposition takes this position, it may be considered a leading indicator in terms of consumer interest. Perhaps more to the point, when large manu food manufacturers and food industry executives are influenced by consumer opinion, they are, they are influenced regardless of the science. So I'll give you a real life example. I want you to now imagine yourselves as being the chief marketing officer of a, a large food and beverage industry. This is a, my client in a true context and what he is seeing in terms of this issue. So put yourself in his position or, and, and, and tell me what you think at the end. He commissions a consumer study, not through us, unfortunately. We would have loved the revenue. <laughs> he hired a competitor, independent market research firm, asked them a question. Go figure out what my consumers care about in the realm of natural, organic, and do a special section on GMO. And I have to blur out the information because it's proprietary research to this particular client. But please trust me that the headlines are what he read the most. <laughs> so the headlines he reads are, four out of 10 consumers today are avoiding or reducing GMOs in their daily diet. GMOs have become potent symbols of the ills of the American food industry. Core consumers report feeling more informed than others about GMOs and express the most concern. Regardless of organic usage, all consumers express concern about the impact of GMOs on their health, but non-organic users are more likely to say they just don't know enough about them. Concerns about the possible impact of GMOs and health are, on the are the top reasons for avoiding them. While there is some ambivalence regarding GMOs, 58% of consumers support mandatory labeling and nearly half support banning. Over half of consumers not aware of the non-GMO seal. Core consumers are more familiar with the non-GMO seal, but a quarter of them say they do not consider it when making choices. While core consumers equate organic with GMO-free, other segments require specific non-GMO or GMO-free labeling. And last in the section, the guy who's paid a good amount of money to basically create brand relevance, which is measured weekly, spending millions of dollars in marketing expenditures to drive the metric on brand equity, which correlates with relevance. And he's evaluated and incentivized on that basis. He reads, companies that stay silent on the issue face the greatest risk of losing consumer trust and relevance. So, you're the chief marketing officer of this food and beverage company. You just spent $100,000 or more to commission this research, which is nationally representative. 
The section on GMO is exactly in terms of conclusions what I just laid out. And your job, fundamentally, your reason for being is to drive brand relevance, therefore consideration and choice. That's what the message he's getting. So what would you do? Now, he's not taking action tomorrow. It's not transformative of their business. But I can tell you that there are active conversations. And it's not the only food industry company that we work with, because it manifests, this conversation manifests itself in various forms and facets by degree in most of the food uh, companies that we work with. He has to make a calculation around his own risk mitigation, not only for his own job, but for his company. And by the way, brand relevance is often tied to company valuation. So he has to think about, well, what are, what, in the push comes to shove, if the tipping point arrives, if consumers really start to be anti-GMO, and that uh, is going to negatively impact us as a company, what are my sourcing alternatives? What are my labeling alternatives? What part of my portfolio do I have that I can still go to market with without any consideration? What public relations activities must I line up just in case? Right? This is, this is what happens and what's happening, at least in this example. So I'm not here to say GMOs are bad or GMOs are good. I am trying to show a little bit of a slice of life around in the business community from a consumer perspective what they encounter in terms of the topic through the most popular media available to them to inform themselves, and then what is being seen from an industry perspective on the same topic. With, the, with the, the potential conclusion being that um, if you're a food executive, you don't have to wait for the science. You just have to wait for the consumer to, to change his or her mind in a way that's going to affect you, you. Or you might just get scared enough on the basis of these kinds of reports that you would change your own practices and then go to market in a different way that sets an industry trend. So. My summary, GMOs are negatively framed, in my view, already. There are many popular and sophisticated anti-GMO communications outlets, quite a few already. Science will be limited in what it can impact. But for me, rather than a wholesale change of opinion, perhaps science should pick its spots. Right? So rather than the title of the slide, rather than you know, migrating an opinion from anti-GMO to pro-GMO, what are the, as Dominique says, the trade-offs that we can more uh, readily uh, articulate to be more informed around the topic. With that, I've, we wanted to leave time for, for discussion or questions. So any questions, we'd be happy to answer them.